their petrochemical plant or their fertilizer plant or any other plant or if it is a, if it is gas it finally finds its way to a particular home this is energy security the entire value chain from beginning to end has to be safeguarded this came to our attention in the context of katrina katrina destroyed the offshore facilities it destroyed power houses it destroyed transmission lines and it made it impossible to ship things across the seas at that time people realized that energy security is not some oil wells in the middle of of the desert it is really the entire value chain that you are looking at and what how do you do that security how do you take advantage of that how do you ensure it you can ensure it only on the basis of regional and international cooperation there are many aspects of this i won't dilate on it for due to shortage of time there were many things that we initiated in support of our energy diplomacy in terms of bilateral dialogue in terms of regional dialogue in terms of regional projects in terms of dialogue at the global level all of these were were were, were motivated to achieve greater domestic resources and to enhance our own inner capability internal capability our national capability but it has ended for a very long time as far as iran is concerned very quickly let me say some of you would be reading what is happening in iran today that iran is not participate cannot india cannot participate in the west led consensus of hostility against iran we iran is a very important partner for us it is a strategic partner well beyond energy it is it is important for in terms of what is happening in afghanistan it is our ally there to keep the taliban at bay it is uh, it is not only important by naturally because of its energy resources world second largest oil reserve world second largest gas reserves it is also a physical link between us and afghanistan and between us and central asia all these things are being mentioned on television but i thought i would just mention it in order to ensure that we do not get captured intellectually by the west which continues to seek to dominate us i have given a map there from chabahar port from chabahar port we have a road that goes up to this point zaranj from zaranj you get into this area this is the hub it is the center of all the road networks of afghanistan so just by constructing this road up to zaranj from zaranj you have access to the entire country that means your goods can move your goals your capabilities your interest can similarly from chabahar you have a road which is an energy economic geo economic which is a new term which is being used now so geo economic and the geo political connectivity it it gives india access direct access to to central asia in due course as the situation in pakistan improves these connectivities will become important we could have the revival of the iran pakistan india pipeline and the turkmenistan afghanistan pakistan india pipeline the concerns relating to these two pipelines are not connected with iran they connected with the situation in pakistan there is not american pressure that has stayed this project it is primarily our concerns with the political situation in pakistan we had a vision we still have that vision though we are we may be disappointed in terms of its implementation there is a sense of asia there is a sense of asian relations as imperialism was retreating in 90 in the 1940s we felt that this was a moment when asia could once again recover its heritage it did not happen because of the cold winds of the cold war which revived some regional and regional animosities and kept the continent divided today there is a sense that so much has happened within asia in terms of economic achievement that possibly just possibly we are at the edge of a situation that can bring us all together once again in pursuit of our own strategic interest as defined by us so we have a sense of that if asian energy security were to be enhanced is because we have the world's major production centers and we have the world's major consumer centers 
60% of Gulf oil is now being consumed in Asia. 90% of Gulf gas is being consumed in Asia. This becomes a very logical foundation for a win-win scenario based on mutual benefit. If you were to look at the statistics, between, within Asia, we find our principal trade partners. Within Asia, we find our principal investment sources. We in Asia have a direct stake in the security and stability of the Gulf. And if we are so critical of Western intervention in the Gulf, which has made the country and the, which, has, which has made the region so unstable, we can no longer remain bystanders. And this is what is the principal diplomatic challenge before us, to engage in a new vision of developing an Asian strategic consensus that would subserve common Asian interests, going away from some of the historic inherited divides and some of those divides that have emerged more recently and seeing whether our common interest allows us, gives us the basis for work, for ensuring, for intervening to ensure Gulf strategic, uh, you know, Gulf security and stability. One idea possible, which I have put down on paper, is BRICS Plus. BRICS already has emerged as an articulate platform for the, uh, and it reflects the concerns that certain countries outside the Western ambit have with regard to political issues, financial issues, and, uh, and economic issues. If you were to bring into this platform other countries with similar interests, for example, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey, and Pakistan, you have the ability to develop it. All of them have a very major stake in the stability, uh, in the stability of the country. Garner these resources. Initially set up dialogue platforms on the basis of a template like the ASEAN Energy Forum, which is a dialogue forum, and uh, move from there into something that becomes more viable and acceptable to the community. This is a practical vision. This is a vision that uh, there is a vision and these suggestions attempt to realize that vision for the interest, not only for national interests, but, the, but for the interest of the entire continent to which we belong. So I will pause at this point. I have arranged widely over a huge number of resources. You've got three lectures in one. <laughs> and therefore, I'm sorry if I fatigued you a bit. And I will be happy to respond to any questions. So, my dear students and colleagues, let me acknowledge that he really gave us a very broad overview and a very comprehensive assessment on the challenges which the Arab world and the West Asian region has been undertaking, and his views on how India has responded and how India has been viewing uh, this uh, West Asian region, I think are all very necessary for us to understand. And let me sir, tell you that Delhi has been a very great, very experience in the future lecture, and it's very long and very comprehensive. We have some time for the question and answer, so we can ask the question if you have. Yes. Uh, Can you introduce yourself? And so my name is Vignesh Ram. Um, I am uh, I'm going to be registering for PhD at the department. And my question to you is, uh, there has always been this idea that Islam is not compatible with democracy. But uh, we have seen instances in the world where that has proved false. Uh, one of the examples is that of Indonesia, which has coexist, being the largest Muslim country in the world, has existed with democratic institutions. So coming to the West Asian region, I'd like to know your thoughts on these new emerging democratic forces and the survivability of these democratic forces in, the, in, these, new country, in these countries. Our intellectual thinking is determined by the West. And this nonsense that you have heard has emanated from the West in order to ensure their hegemony, not only over our territories and our resources, but over our mind. Imperialism never, never, never gives up 
Do not imagine that the 21st century will be an Asian century because we wish it, sitting in our, uh, in our homes, in wherever we are. It will have to be struggled for and every obstacle will be placed in our way. Then in this idea, there is a long history to it. This history is primarily Zionist in character. It is Zionist discourse that project. first time it was put down on paper was by Bernard Lewis. Bernard Lewis is the great scholar of Islam and of West Asia. Bernard Lewis. Do they keep his name in mind? He is the only scholar I have come across who actively despises his subject matter. He despises the Muslim people and the Muslim history and culture. He gave the idea in 1957 of a clash of civilization in order to explain why the Arab people were so upset with the invasion of Egypt in 1953. He gave the explanation to the British, because he is of, of the British origin but now living in the United States. He said that there is a clash of civilization, that there is us, the developed Western modern civilization, and there is that. But then it was put on the back burner. He revived this idea in 1990. As the Cold War came to an end, he wrote a paper, The Roots of Muslim Anger, 1990. His disciple Samuel Huntington wrote the book in paper 1993, The Clash of Civilization, which he elaborated in a book in 1993. All these were to provide a justification for continued Western opposition. Now a new enemy, quote unquote, Islam was created. And Huntington's paper and book were trashed as soon as they came. But they got a certain resonance in Bush's United States in 1990, in 2001, after the 9-11. Then yes, there is something peculiarly obnoxious about Islam and the Muslim people, that they are unfit for democracy. It, it completely rubs off the entire, uh, that is the entire narrative of intervention and deprivation starting from Versailles, starting from 200 years of colonialism and then going on from the Versailles arrangement where there is active Western intrusion based on regime change and various other policies which have ensured this region does not get democracy. Please do not let anyone tell you that a certain people are not fit for democracy. Since when did democracy <coughs> become a Western virtue? The well, countries of the West had no democracy till a few years ago. Some of them were fascist a few years ago. There was massive bloodletting a few years. The Holocaust against the Jewish people was not done by the Asian, the African and the Latin American ever. The only people who gave sanctuary to the Jewish people for the last 2000 years of their, of their diaspora were the Muslim countries and the Muslim communities. So daily they rubbish, we should rubbish this kind of nonsense which has penetrated our mind. All people are capable of and aspire to, to be free. All of us have individual dignity. What we are talking about are not Western values. We are talking about universal values. When, since when has the, can you name one country in the world where the West has promoted democracy? They are very uncomfortable with democracy because they would prefer to have dictatorship that sell the country interest. Look at the example of Pakistan next door to us. Pakistan was specifically created by a retreating imperialist power in order to ensure that Western strategic interests would continue to be subserved in South Asia, in West Asia and in Central Asia. This is the literature. The papers, all official papers of partition are today locked up and they will not come out even in 2050, I think, because they will explain the thinking, the role of the British in the partition of our country. Similarly, the creation of Israel. Again, a retreating imperialist power did that. All of these interventions and depredations that have been done have retarded large sections of Asian, African, Latin America. Did Latin America become democratic because of the Americans or in spite of the Americans? Do recall their history. Every, some of the most wretched dictators in the world used to rule that. Did we ever say that Christians are not fit for democracy? How many Christian countries of Latin America were free? Why did we not say that? You know, did we ever say that Buddhist countries are incapable of freedom because of China, Buddhist country, or 
whatever. This is absolute nonsense. And why you read the criticisms of Samuel Huntington, where he has picked up one aspect, what he calls civilization and religion. He has been rubbish by most scholars and today has no value or evidence. The scholar, even in you know, Fukuyama, when he first celebrated the success of the West, he realized his folly and wrote the second book, which is called After the New Cause. It's got two titles. One is in the United States and one is in the one in the English publication. Basically, he retracted because he saw the depredations of Bush's America. After this triumph, he saw their interventions and depredations, particularly because of Iraq. He saw the bombardment of Afghanistan, where 4,000 people were killed from the skies, and then he saw the assault, the U.S. assault in Iraq, and he wrote a new book after that. He's, now he's coming up with a massive work, which is called History of Human Institutions, Volume 1 only has come out. It's only up to the French Revolution. But in an interview he has spoken, in the context of the release of the first volume, in, the, in an interview he has spoken about how he is deeply concerned today about the state of Western democratic parties, a Western democratic entity. He said that democracy is not functioning. People don't come out to vote. The governments that emerge no longer reflect the aspirations of the people because they are a result of intervention of lobbies and interest groups. So there are serious problems here. Look at the economic malaise that has emerged just now. The economic malaise is a failure of regulation, it's a rampant corruption, manipulation of the LIBOR, which is the most sacred instrument of international interaction. Nobody has been ever punished, except two banks, because they dealt with Iran. Basically, his, his question was directly on that one day, a critique of the US policy of promoting democracy abroad. So that really no, don't mean what is not there. Don't mean what is not there. This is what is not there. All the countries that have become free are due to the aspirations of their exactly. own. My point is that I, in fact, uh, said that Indonesia you know, is an example of Islam and democracy that exist together. So supporting the US. Yeah. 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 This question was mostly on the critique of the US policy. Yeah. My name is Shashekar. I'm in first year a year of work. Is a Wahhabi became the Wahhabi sect became the tool for the British to create a divide and rule policy in 1920 and replacing the uh, Shah family with the South Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia. So did I understand you right? Wahhabia was part of divide and rule policy, which led to the confrontation between Saudi Al Saud and the Shah. Is that your yes, question? Is that, is that a question yes, or is it a question? Is it a question? Was Wahhabism used as a tool of divide and rule between these two? Between Iran and Saudi Arabia. You know, when the Shah was ruling Iran, United States, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran have pretty good relations. You know, we should not look at only religion as explaining that they were have common strategic interests. They were on the same side of the strategic divide. The same as Pakistan. Many people look at the divide between India and Pakistan as a religious divide. It's not a religious divide. It was a strategic divide because this Pakistan was part of the other. Wahhabia is, was a reform doctrine that emerged in the 18th century. It was part of that introspection I mentioned right at the beginning where Muslim people were looking at themselves and criticizing the state of Islamic societies, which they believed had aberrations and had moved away from uh, uh, the path, the true path of Islam. And he was a radical platform in that when he wanted aberrations to be removed, he was not tolerant of many other practices that had emerged at the popular level. Particularly, he had a very strong religious discourse pertaining to the meaning of texts, etc. But in terms of practical implementation, he was opposed to worshipping at shrines. He was opposed to mysticism. The most common attribute is this Wahhabiya rejects this. We are seen as aberrations. By the time you come to what they did was in that 18th century, the tribal chief ruling at Diraya in the heart of Saudi Arabia, entered into a religio-politico-military alliance with 
from what it may have been Wahab. In that, he asked him to give legitimacy to his political expansion. And in turn, he promised that the state that would emerge from these efforts, his reform doctrines would constitute the basis of that state. That is how it emerged. None of that happened. The Saudi state was destroyed by Ottoman and Egyptian intervention. But when King Abdulaziz set up the Saudi state over a period of time between 1902 and 1932, in 1932 he declared the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. There were many things in between. Wahhabiya was the state doctrine. But try as you might in the kingdom, you would have no reference ever heard by you to religious dispute, religious views. It has entirely become a social a social uh, conduct platform. It's, and it's obsessive about women. So it has nothing to do with religion. This obsession about women is a pre-modern, primarily tribal uh, concern. Very often manifested also in new urban societies as is being done in India. Means that from a rural background you come into some of these concerns are centralized around women. And it is actually a, a terror of women as sexual persons that their gender frightens you. And that's why you say the honor of my society is, cent is centered around women's modesty. And because when men are source of temptation, they should be segregated. And if they are segregated, they not, cannot work side by side. There should be restrictions on their movement. So as a result,